So it is my pleasure today and honor to introduce our speaker, Michael Simpson. Um, not only is he one of our own, he was also the executive director of my foundation, the Secure World Foundation, up until December of this year when he retired, although I think his wife Carol would question whether he's really <laughs> retired since his travel schedule and involvements are still something. In fact, he was the very first person to sign up for Secure World's uh, Space Sustainability Summit in Washington, DC. And we would have comped him, but he paid full fare. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so Mike um, retired as, from the Naval Reserve in 93 with the uh, rank of commander and his practical service includes a political military action officer. He's been a observer representative at the UN Committee on the uh, Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. He was our representative to the group on Earth Observations and a member of the Association of Space Explorers International Panel on Asteroid Threat Mitigation. He's still currently serving with the Commercial Space Flight Safety and Space Security Committees, and he's the Vice Chair of the House of the Hague, wait, Vice Chair of the Hague Space Resources Governance Working Group. He's also on the Governing Board of the World Space Week and a Governor in the National Space Society. So there is nobody better qualified to discuss the topic he's going to share today. Well, let me see if I can get this wire to reconnect. There we go. So anyhow, almost everybody has at least seen some material about space debris. There's been a lot of discussion about space debris. There's even been a certain amount of um, Hollywood interest in space debris. How many people have seen the movie Gravity? Okay, you know, there's a lot of scientific criticism of that movie. The fact of the matter is, if it left you with the impression that space debris is a problem, then it's done everything Hollywood needed to do, because it is a problem. Uh, is it a problem at the level you saw in Gravity? Well, certainly not yet. Uh, but we're talking, we're going to talk today a bit about what the real status is of the space debris problem, what some of the things that are being done to correct that problem are, and to get a feel of what the real uh, implication is of not paying sufficient attention uh, to the debris problem. So let's look at a few facts. Uh, the first um, is already subject to change. Uh, uh, 1,750 operational satellites in orbit are now up over 1,900 operational satellites in orbit. For those of you that have sort of a geek interest in this, uh, the, um, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists maintains a database of operational satellites. You can check it about three or four times a year. Uh, it is rather amazing how rapidly this number is going up as we develop more and more small satellites right down to satellites that are no bigger than this, a so-called a single unit CubeSat. So um, now that number is already up over uh, 1,900. There are more than 70 countries who currently operate or have operated satellites in orbit. Um, compare this to the reality in the 1960s where uh, there were three or four uh, countries uh, doing that. The United States and the Soviet Union, of course, uh, France, Canada, and Australia got into the business pretty early, but it didn't, it didn't increase very rapidly until sometime around the uh, 1980s and 90s as more and more countries realized that space was very much a part of their future. We are currently tracking 23,000 pieces, plus or minus a little, of human-related objects in Earth orbit. Most of this is debris, that is non-active uh, satellites. 
Um, and our limitations on tracking are important here uh, because we can only confidently track pieces that are 10 centimeters in diameter or larger. 10 centimeters to have an image in your mind is approximately the size of a softball, okay? So we can track cannonballs in orbit, but we can't track 20 millimeter bullets in orbit. Um, so understand there's a lot of stuff in orbit that is potentially dangerous that we are not currently able to track. Now, we think we're gonna make a pretty big breakthrough on tracking in the next year or two. The United States is bringing a new radar online on Kwajalein Island that will be able to, to give us a chance at tracking objects down to two centimeters. So, there are about 500,000 pieces, we think, that are as big as two centimeters. So two centimeters, again, is not the kind of thing you necessarily think about in terms of understanding the size. That's about the length of a 22 caliber bullet. Uh, the diameter of a 22 caliber bullet's a lot smaller than that, but the length is about um, uh, the same as a uh, 22 uh, caliber bullet. And so, since I can't show you video of debris collisions on orbit, uh, we haven't quite gotten to that point yet, um, I have found a couple of videos that can give you a sense of the energies involved in a collision between objects that are related to this two millimeter size. So this is um, <clears throat> another operational crisis. Um, this is a, the beginning of a um, beginning of a uh, slow motion video taken by Werner Mail, a German expert in this field who's developed a technique that simulates a slow motion at a million frames per second. Okay? What we're going to see are two videos that he has done showing the impact of a 22 caliber bullet on an object, this first video, and the second showing the impact of birdshot in a field as a 22 caliber bullet goes through it. These are two circumstances which do simulate the problem of debris on orbit. But keep in mind some of the differences. Uh, 22 caliber bullet goes at about 100,000 uh, feet per second, uh, especially long rifle uh, supercharged ammunition. Um, on orbit, an object is moving at about 25,000 feet per second. 25,000 feet per second. The difference, of course, is that most objects are going from east uh, to west. So they're all going in the same direction. There's a very limited number of things that are going uh, uh, east, uh, 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 that are basically, let me change that. Uh, things are moving towards the east, whereas a limited number of objects are moving towards the west. Uh, the Israelis launched some objects for a while towards the west to avoid panicking uh, Iraq and Iran. Um, but that means that most collisions in orbit are at relative speeds, not absolute speeds. And so a relative speed of 1,000 feet per second is not unheard of. And so these videos will give you some sense of the energies involved. Notice this explosion backwards. Newton's laws are not suspended in space. This is an equal and opposite reaction to the initial impact. This dust presents relatively little problem, but these little particles that you see embedded are all big enough that, as we'll see in a little while, they can be debris issues. The ones that are coming back are almost always being slowed down and will begin to decay a little faster. The ones on the other side where you see the momentum is, of the bullet has been transferred 
those particles actually tend to rise in orbit so that your debris problem is not just in the specific orbit in which the collision occurred, but it's spread out over a range simply because Newton's, doing, Newton's laws are not repealable. And so uh, really um, uh, keeping this in mind as we take a look at some later images uh, will be useful. Okay, here, this second um, video, we're looking at a 22 caliber bullet and it's moving through what will be a simultaneously detonated field of uh, birdshot. Because what I want you to see is what happens when two little objects bump into each other. Because we're increasingly concerned that some of these 500,000 objects that are only two centimeters in size will start bumping into each other. And when they start bumping into each other, they produce objects which are smaller, but still large enough, as we'll see, to cause some damage. So uh, here's a 22 uh, in a field of birdshot. There's an enormous amount of energy when two objects meet at the same place. And you can see all these bits and pieces that are uh, prepared, uh, that are created by the collision. Even a glancing blow like that uh, produces a significant amount of, um, of debris. Yeah, and he's just showing off there, putting a bullet through a uh, tire iron. Oh. But again, this is all debris. Most of this is sub-millimeter size, uh, in effect, real dust. Uh, but the larger pieces uh, can, be, uh, can be a problem. So uh, one of the more common images of space debris or tends to look like this. Space debris is a tough thing to create a graphic for. Um, it really isn't as bad as this. Um, keep in mind, the surface area of the Earth is about 510 million square kilometers. If you add 450 kilometers to the radius of the Earth to create the virtual sphere in which the space station operates, you have a sphere that would have a surface area that is 75 or so million square kilometers bigger. Uh, bigger sphere, bigger surface area. The, trying to illustrate debris in an environment where you might have one piece of debris in, in a square kilometer, or even more importantly, in a cubic kilometer, uh, is, a, is a tough thing to give people a sense of what's going on. It is worrisome enough, though, because we don't use the entire surface area of that virtual sphere. There are certain pieces of it, as we'll see here in a minute, that are really important. And so we concentrate our debris along the highways in orbit, not along the entire surface area. And that's increasingly a matter of concern, even if we don't look out as if somehow we were trying to form a, a ring in, in competition with Saturn. Now, from a distance, not even a huge distance, this is what we look like. Uh, it's really one of the most beautiful pictures uh, taken from space. This is Earth and the moon looking closer to each other than they are because the, sat the spacecraft that took the picture is actually closer to the moon than it is to Earth. But there's no ring around Earth. Uh, Wally doesn't see an entire uh, collection of debris that it has to fly the spacecraft through. Um, Look from a little bit further on. Uh, this picture was taken by the Messenger spacecraft to Mercury uh, several years ago that shows Earth and uh, its moon from a position about 30 million miles from the sun. Again, no ring. Um, but again, keep that idea in your mind. The highways can be crowded and covered with debris, even if the total environment doesn't look like it is. From a distance, 
uh, we look fine. So what's the problem? Well, um, objects in Earth orbit are moving at about 17,000 miles per hour, um, which is a problem not only in terms of the kinetic energy they have when they bump into something, uh, but also it's a problem in catching them uh, because you need an extraordinary amount of energy just to get to orbit, and once you're in orbit, you have a lot of complex maneuvering to get to the same orbit as the debris at the same speed so you don't collide with each other and create more debris. There are three orbital regions um, that have become especially valuable. Low Earth orbit, which is the orbit up to about 2,000 kilometers, where you can get tremendous resolution of images. Uh, Digital Globe, just down the way from us, uh, has been doing remarkable work in imagery from space in that low Earth orbit area. There is a middle Earth orbit that goes from about 2,000 kilometers all the way out to 35,600 kilometers, um, but is especially useful in orbits that go over the poles. Um, those orbits enable a satellite to view the same part of Earth fairly regularly. Uh, but they have the problem that when you pass over the pole, you're passing over close to a single point. And so every time there's a satellite pass at that point, those satellites can get close to each other. Um, and that's obviously a problem. And then there's this high orbit we call, 30, uh, we call geosynchronous orbit, which is at a very specific 35,660 some uh, kilometers, where an orbit can be designed so that it appears to be stationary in space. Uh, that's because it's orbiting at exactly the same speed as Earth's rotation and therefore it seems to hover, or does hover, over the same spot on Earth. Uh, all three of those orbits have debris problems. Um, and um, it doesn't matter if the rest of space doesn't, because those are the orbits that are particularly useful to us. Only objects in low Earth orbit decay in any reasonable time. That is, something that's orbiting at 400 or 500 kilometers actually is still bumping into vestigial amounts of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, you know, one hydrogen atom maybe every square meter. But they're bumping into those things, and that slows them down every time they bump in because they're going 17,000 miles an hour, and that will cause the object to descend. The space station, for example, is reboosted every couple of weeks uh, to keep it from falling out of orbit. We don't have any reliable technology for cleaning up the mess. Um, this is not a question that we're not doing it. We just don't have it. We are developing it. We'll show you a couple pictures here, but it isn't there yet. Even worse, we don't have a business plan for figuring out how we pay for it. Uh, everybody's pointing at somebody else saying they ought to pay for it. Um, and it's almost as if we're waiting for a gigantic crisis uh, before we get it paid for. We don't have space traffic controllers. There is a lot of talk now about creating a system of space traffic control where we could actually tell an operator of a satellite they must move it to avoid a collision. Uh, one collision that did occur in uh, 2009 occurred between two satellites, only one of which was maneuverable, and the maneuverable satellite chose not to maneuver when warned because the previous 10 warnings hadn't been valid. Um, and then there was a collision. So uh, Murphy's Law works in space, too. There are millions of debris objects smaller than two centimeters. Millions. Uh, you know, a vacuum cleaner won't work in space. Um, and we have produced most satellites out of non-magnetic material because magnetic material gets in the way of their electronics. And so we can't use giant magnets in space. So we've had to really get creative about what we can do 
uh, with space debris. To give you a sense of the potential of a space debris impact, this is a fairly famous picture from an early shuttle mission. Uh, this is the outer glazing of a space shuttle uh, windshield. This was created by an impact um, that we believe is a fleck of paint. Uh, we actually found evidence of the paint in the center of that impact area. A fleck of paint. So it's not just the big things that cause damage. Uh, this was designed to handle an impact, uh, but nobody ever thought you could get damage like this out of a fleck of paint. This is a, um, uh, an impact on the cupola of the space station. This is that beautiful view area from which we're getting unbelievable pictures now that astronauts are taking for us. It's about seven millimeters um, uh, across. Uh, probably hard for you to, uh, uh, to see, but right about here, there's a tiny impact crater um, that is less than a millimeter. And that, um, that looks as if it was hit by some piece of debris less than a millimeter in size. Less than a millimeter in size. That's the cupola with an astronaut in it. Uh, if this had penetrated, uh, that astronaut would have died instantly from decompression. Uh, as uh, Tim Peake, the British astronaut, uh, said, I'm glad it's quadruple glazed. Uh, in fact, this only damaged the outer glazing of four glazings, but that was less than a millimeter in size. <coughs> So, um, what are some of the solutions worth trying? Debris mitigation, uh, we're already working to try to reduce the creation of debris. There are two ways we do that, particularly right now. Reducing debris caused by launchers. We used to use all sorts of techniques that threw springs and explosive bolts and chunks of metal into space every time we launched. We are dramatically reducing the use of those technologies. So just like we're getting you to shift from incandescent bulbs to LEDs, the space people are trying to shift to much less damaging technologies. Space traffic management is widely discussed now. There have been several UN meetings on ways in which we could manage the interaction of satellites on orbit. On-orbit servicing refers to actually repairing satellites that have become debris and restoring them to use and maneuverability. Uh, that includes refueling in some cases uh, because there are several satellites on orbit that are perfectly healthy except they ran out of maneuvering fuel. Um, one of which is about six metric tons that is uh, um, ironically was originally designed to be an envir environmental monitoring satellite. Um, active debris removal is what we are looking for the technologies to do. That is, what could we do to clean things up in a world where we can't use a vacuum cleaner? Um, and adherence to IADC guidelines. The Interagency Debris Committee is a committee of several countries in the world that have launch and satellite operating abilities. They've actually gotten guidelines uh, presented through the UN that have been adopted and are maybe 50% complied with. We still have a long way to go to get full compliance here. But they include such things you may have heard of as deorbiting a, a defunct satellite <coughs> within 25 years of its end of life. Um, uh, that's a not a terribly bold goal, but it's better than just leaving it up there forever. Uh, the oldest piece of space debris that we track, by the way, in space is American, so it's not all a foreign problem. Uh, it's a Vanguard rocket body from uh, the early days of the space era before 1960 that got thrown into space uh, and is operating in an elliptical orbit. So there are old problems out there, and I, I show you this Russian uh, Soviet, as you can see, um, a satellite. This was the uh, Venera 
um, the Venera 8 satellite uh, that successfully landed on uh, Venus. Uh, some of it is probably still surviving on the surface, although the surface is 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the problem is it had a twin. Its twin is known as Cosmos 482. It didn't make it to out of Earth orbit, but its orbit is decaying. Um, it has a, a perigee that is a close approach to Earth of about 140 miles. That is slowly reducing, but its apogee, its distance from uh, Earth, which is about 2,500 miles, is declining rapidly, which is an indication that it's losing energy. <coughs> this will probably return to Earth late this year or next. <coughs> the problem is most satellites that return to Earth burn up in orbit, uh, burn up as they re-enter the atmosphere. Ain't no way this is going to do that, because it was designed to penetrate the Venusian atmosphere. Uh, Venus's atmosphere is a hundred times thicker than ours. This baby will come down intact. And uh, although the odds that it's going to fall on your head are extraordinarily small, uh, the odds that it's going to make it down to Earth on its own uh, without burning up are extraordinarily large. And so we're paying a lot of attention to this piece of debris, uh, which um, um, frankly, the Russians are not being very forthcoming about data about what's really left up there. There are all sorts of techniques for trying to get at uh, debris. This is a harpoon system. Um, there's a video of this thing being tested last year. You can find it on YouTube. Interesting technology for going after larger pieces. Uh, it's not going to help you with millimeter sized pieces, but it could help you with uh, fairly large pieces of metal, such as the kind that was expelled from uh, um, uh, launchers at one point in the history of the space era. So what's at stake? Um, accurate weather reporting. Don't believe if a representative in Congress tells you we don't need it because he can find the weather on the Weather Channel. Um, um, <laughs> I, I've, I've talked to meteorologists that say there was no possible way to track these three hurricanes simultaneously and understand their dynamic interaction without space. Um, and so these satellites are in polar orbit. So every time they cross the pole, they run the risk of a collision. Uh, effective disaster response. Uh, uh, we're looking at a fire here in California, but we certainly know fires here. Pinpointing them, measuring their heat, determining the hydrology around the fire, all of that can be done by space. The more debris we have, the bigger the problem of maneuvering satellites around this stuff. Uh, ATMs, you may not realize it, but every time you use an AT ATM, your transaction is time stamped to a thousandth of a second. They use GPS satellites for that. And ATMs, some ATMs even have a security mechanism that sends an alarm if the GPS location of the, set of the ATM changes by more than 10 feet. Uh, well, guess what's happening if it does. So um, uh, cell phone service, here's another surprise for people. You do not use a satellite to send your signal unless you've got an Iridium cell phone. But, but cell phones are coordinated. They are... They are um, uh, linked chronologically to the tower by GPS. GPS is what synchronizes the cell towers. Uh, it's a lot more efficient than using the, the time signal out of NIST. Um, <clears throat> Real-time broadcast, obviously, uh, is important. And biomedical developments have been extraordinary. If any of you have anyone in your family that's ever had osteoporosis, uh, the cause of osteoporosis was discovered in space uh, because men and women came back with it as frequently um, um, as each other, whereas on Earth, uh, women have osteoporosis five times as frequently as men. So they recognized that gravity has some effect on osteoporosis. That led them to understanding electromagnetic signaling in the lower legs uh, that affects your deposition of calcium. Really quite remarkable but it's an indication of the importance of perspective in finding answers. 
So there are also home ground issues. You know, Boulder looks pretty neat from space. <clears throat> uh, sometimes it looks a little smoky from space. Um, it becomes useful, however, to have images like this. Uh, but we need very much today to recognize that as much as this looks like our neighborhood, uh, it's, it's not our only neighborhood. Uh, space helps us recognize that the neighborhood's bigger and that uh, we have one small neighborhood to improve. So thanks for being a part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Hey, thanks. Sorry I took the time. Uh, appreciate your uh, excellent uh, recitation of many, many statistics. Uh, <clears throat> I was well into my professional career well over two years before Sputnik, doing flight test engineering on, on uh, advanced jet engines. And then we went on 12 years later to land on the moon. We'll talk about that later. After 26 years of arduous work, Rotary and its partners are on a brink of eradicating this tenacious disease. But a strong push is needed now to root it out once and for all. It is conceivable for polio to be eradicated in the next few years. It is a window of opportunity of historic proportions as we move forward with the polio in-game strategy. And we'll present these 100 doses in your name. <laughs> 